All right. Today is September 12th, uh, 2015, and I'm interviewing Brother Judd about his Vietnam War experience. So. So. He asked me the other day about boot camp, and maybe even a little bit about the war, how it come to be. And so I give him a movie called Full Metal Jacket, because it's the most correct out of all the movies as far as boot camps come. If you look around the town, how many army flags do you see? None. If you look around, see how many navy flags do you see? No. None. How many marines ones? Zero. A few. Because once a marine, always a marine. And that's where the boot camp comes in as far as I don't know what to call it, as far as making you into a Marine. Okay, all Marines come in on Wednesday night at 12 o'clock. And the first thing they do is the, D got, the DI comes, and there's three DIs. Uh, there's the senior one and two helpers. And he starts cussing you. Uh, you're a nerd. You're a, I won't need to say all the words because you know them. But I will maybe a little bit later. And I remember he said, uh, is anybody out there chewing gum? And uh, no, I was chewing gum, so I kept going. And the guy in the front seat, he slapped him, knocked his head right against the window. He said, these kids swallow their gum. So you, you go in, and the first thing you do after sitting in your footsteps for quite a long time is you go get your hair cut. Everybody gets their hair cut bald. You don't get, while you're in boot camp or in infantry training, there's no hair on your head. In fact, if you look at a Marine, you'll see that under his hat, from the from the rim down, he's uh, tan, but he takes his hat off, and he's white, because the Marine has been taught, you don't go outside without your cover, cover meaning hat, and uh, and you don't salute to anyone without your hat on. Like you see in the movies, the army and stuff to go, they, they do that, but the Marines don't. Okay, so here we go. The next thing you do is you take everything you have, everything, watches, rings, pencils, whatever, and you put them in a box and you put your name on it and they send it home. And the answer to that question is, why are we doing that? And the answer is, because if we wanted you to have something, we'd give it to you. Or sometimes they said, if you wanted a mother, I'm your mother now. Anyway, so they go ahead and get that done. And then they go into a shower and de louse everybody. And you say, well, that's kind of icky, but you have people from everywhere in the United States that some have gum booty, you know, you don't know what they have. So you get that done, you walk out of there, and they tell you to grab your ankles, and then they proceed to put their finger up your butt to see if you got anything going on there. And this, there's nothing private. This is all in a squad bay with 
holds 120 people. There's no privacy. And then you go uh, get your uh, mattress and a sack, it's called a fart sack, because it goes over the, uh, shoot, the bed, anyway, and it, the, the bed's still good for somebody else, next ones. So, instead of going to, we was in a squad bay, and that means there was six on one side and six on the other. You need this show one? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, and, and that's your home. Contrary to the Navy and the others, the DI gets you up in the morning and stays with you until you go to bed. My girlfriend, we got the, we got the right letters when half the Catholics went, the Protestants, we got to write a letter. And then when the, uh, the other way come back and the Protestants go, the Catholics got to write a letter. I soon learned that I didn't want to do the Catholic thing because you have to stand up for all that, stand up too much. <laughs> and they didn't sing songs I knew. So anyway, they walk you through until that next night. You're carrying your sack and they act like there isn't a place for you. But there is a place for you, and they know where you're going. So I joined with my buddy, Bill Mann, and we joined in the buddy system, which means theoretically we're supposed to be with each other. He was an M and I was a J. I didn't see Billy uh, until about the fifth day because you were looking straight forward at the guy in front of you. And the DI would say, I can hear some eyeball sockets moving. And, uh, and they, they tease you stuff like this. And then they, they want to, the, the purpose is to demean you. So no one is extra effort. I mean, there isn't a star. You're all the same. You all got your your buddy's back. Yeah. Nobody goes off doing their own thing, which tells you. And uh, I'll i bet I'll go with that a little bit later. But uh, and then when you go to bed, no one gets up. You just got to hold it because you can't get out of your bed. Anyway, I was going with the girl very uh, heavily, uh, almost getting married. And she wrote me a letter and she says, why don't you write me every day? She says, what's his name did? And I thought, well, have what's his name call you, read you. You know, I can't do it. And I didn't spell that well anyway. So, of course, you didn't have anything. And then they give you shoes. There are some brown ones and some are black. But everybody has to be the same. So the black ones get scrubbed off with the SOS pad so they can re dye it so everybody will have black shoes. And the whole thing is to make everybody do it. Now they make you put your hat down to your eyeballs, they make you button your button right up top, they won't let you blouse your boots, you know what that means, blousing them? Yeah. They put a little elastic here and then it holds in a circle, holds them up from dragging. But you can't do that because you're not a Marine. So they make you do, do that. And uh, he was from McMullen. He was from Chicago. And I saw him get up every night and pee in his bed. And then they'd send him to the hospital. But what he was trying to do is to get out. And you say to yourself, well, why, why not just say, I'm out of here. You know, I don't do it. It's not how it works. You took an oath. And you have to stand by that oath. And so if you fall down and don't make it, you have to start all over again. 
in a new platoon. So you got just 13 weeks, start it over again. So everybody is uh, don't want don't want that to happen. Well, we had a guy named Kurgalvis. I think it's Kurgalvis. No, Benavides. He was one like that was in this movie that you saw. Uh, he was slow. We had to, if we were on a hike, we had to pick him up because we all had to be there at the same time. I, I don't, I don't believe I ever saw anybody do the. It's called a code red, but I did see one get a couple wax. To try and straighten them up because, first of all, you want to be the the best platoon, and if you got this loser, you can't do it. And if he fails, everybody fails. So you you learn now to cover your your buddy, help him out, make sure that nobody's left behind. So. One thing that happened. But may I ask you a question? Yes. Do you nurture them, or do you give them a tough love? No. It, well, some guys, some guys are brutal, you know. But uh -huh. most guys have a heart. They just know that, like Benavides, he couldn't shoot. He big, fat, sloppy. Uh -huh. And that brings up another question you had uh -huh. about the donut in the locker. Yeah. And when he found out he had the donut, he got down on him, right? Yeah. But he got down on him because he was a fat slob. Mm -hmm. And if he's eating donuts, he's not going to get slim and trim, and he will not graduate. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not the, 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 the demean him or anything like that. It's, it's just to help him go along. Mm -hmm. Because they have one called the Fat Guy Platoons, where they help them. And then they give them each a rake and a shovel and stuff, and they walk around <laughs> all until they lose some weight. And uh, I'm going to check here. There, once you get out of boot camp, there are no heroes. Everybody's a hero given certain circumstances. Obviously, some are actually heroes because the circumstances make that happen. But let's see, the motivation for writing this script was he was trying to make a political statement over about the war. When you uh, go to Vietnam or any war thing, you get handed your cover that goes over your metal, uh, or metal uh, pot. And that pro some of them were probably already on there. They never, they never did it. But everybody wanted to be able to say, I'm a kill, I can kill. Give me your war face. I'll stand up, I won't let you down. And I was worried about it when I went to Vietnam. At first I thought, well, what'll happen if I chicken out? You know, that worried me a lot. And I didn't, but uh, so it's still back to doing this Spirit of decor, all this stuff, and then they strip you down, and then they build you back up, and then you're starting to say, oh, I'm a Marine. Well, they won't let you be a Marine because you haven't got your, your you haven't graduated. And uh, like there was that scene where uh, that guy was up on the two poles when he had to go over. Yeah. That actually happened to me. I got over there and I got afraid of getting down. 
And the DI says, everybody pick up a rock. <laughs> <laughs> and they started chucking, so I, I came down. Uh, a lot of foul language, a lot of demeaning. I like if uh, one time it was raining really hard, and when you march, you're supposed to put drive your heel in so that you're in a cadence. It was raining, and DI couldn't have a, help it or hear me, hear us. So we all had to squat down and wave our arms because we were ducks. We, <laughs> we went, couldn't walk, then we learned how to be a duck. And it's stuff like that that means something about what's going on. But the whole thing is camaraderie. And uh, when I remember, I think I told you, when I went to the uh, bayonet course, and uh, you, you had to thrust the dummy, and, but you had to say each time, kill, kill. So they're driving into you, and to tell you the truth, at the end of boot camp, if our DI says, go take uh, uh, San Diego, we've done it. I mean, we were hyped up. They, they got us feeling, because we were, our whole bodies were better, you know, and, and uh, but uh, when you, I'll go back to the letters. When you get a letter, the DI gets the letters. And then what he does is he hands it out, private jet, here's a year letter. So as you go up to do it, he goes lay that. And make sure there's no pokey, get, pokey bait, gum, candy. One guy had his, <laughs> a picture of his girlfriend naked, uh, actually it's three or four of them naked. And the DI published that on the, on the, DI's hooch, so everybody could see it. Now back to the guy who get up and wet his bed. He finally broke his arm and got out. But we'd be going down marching and we'd stop and uh, he'd say to the other DI going by, you want to meet my bed wetter? And so they'd come up and so he would introduce him like that. <laughs> you know. But he did one thing which you never do, you never talk back to, to the DI, uh, ever. But he did, because uh, the, I think it was a major. He says, uh, so have you got a girlfriend? He says, yeah. He says, so what do you do all night? Just sit there and pee on each other? And so the guy says, no, we're just trying to keep warm. And we started to laugh, and then we knew that was the wrong thing. You know, because we'd have been not there doing push-ups. One time I was out on the rifle range, and you get in a position, and you keep in that same position for hours and hours. It's called snapping in, so that your, your body can get into the position to shoot properly. And there was a, there was a bug. And uh, there's a black guy next to me, and uh, we were pushing the bug one way, and he pushed the bug the other way. And all of a sudden, I feel this foot on my back, and hit him too. So he says, uh, Private Judd, pick up that bug. And he says, hold it, make sure that it doesn't die. So we'd go all day long, and right in front of the squad day is a, a sand pit. And what they would say to you if you did something stupid, go out there and do uh, squat thrusts forever, or until you fall down, you know. But anyway, so I have this bug, and the DI says, you know, we're, we're going to have a funeral. So. I had to dig a six foot hole. It wasn't six wide, but it was a six foot hole. And I got a soap dish and we put a little cotton balls on it. And then we sang the Marine Corps hymn. 
and I put the cap on and put him back in the sand and covered it all up. And then the DI says, Private, was that bug's feet going up or going down? There's no, no answer. You know, either one you say, you got to dig that hole back up and see that the bug has its feet in the proper position. And then, uh, uh, they, they would get up uh, two in the morning and throw a garbage can down the, the uh, squad bay. Yeah. Just sometimes full, sometimes not. Get up, get up. And then, uh, uh, so, but that's not funny. It's not, I mean, that's, that's, uh, you're already tired as a dog. And uh, so, trying to think, uh, at Christmas time, my girlfriend that was about not to be my girlfriend any longer, sent me five pounds of fudge. And uh, there's a couple other guys that got something. One of the guys got brill cream. Well, you know, we have no hair. So the DI made him put a dab of brill cream on everybody's head. And then uh, the next guy, he got cologne. So he had to go spray everybody and share with the thing. But I got the five pounds of fudge. He said, come up here and eat the fudge. And he's pushing in my mouth, trying to get me to eat it. And he had salt water, trying to get me to wash it down. And I threw up a couple of times, but I finally got it eaten. And then he says, you know, Private Judge, you got something sweet and nobody else does. So you go out in the sand pit and work forever. He just bought for us. You know, and then uh, another thing, uh, it's important for a lot of these guys that smoke to have their thing. So uh, if, if he would say the smoking lamp is lit. And then everybody that used to have camels and stuff started buying Pall Malls because they were longer. But they're pretty upset. They're, you know, for somebody has got to have it, this is a problem. So uh, one night, uh, one of the guys sneaked out into the uh, Dipty dumpster and was smoking a cigarette. And the DI came in and caught him. So he put a whole pack of cigarettes in his mouth, lit them, and then put a bucket on his head. And then he didn't stop till he passed out. It's, it's them type of things, and so it's no joke. These things all actually happen because they're trying to build you up, trying to build your confidence. Uh, no whining like Marines don't cry, you know, something like that. So that's uh, let me look at what else you might say. And boot camp is longer in the Marine Corps than the rest of them. Most of them was, I think it's about six weeks. And Marine is three, 13 weeks and then another four weeks of you know, infantry training. Because uh, MOS, that's your job. That's what your, your title is. Like, as an electrician, I was 1141. But every Marine had to be an O111. Every man had to be a rifleman first. It didn't matter about the other thing. So you had to make sure that you could go. And uh, the Marines is a NATO force. There's always Marines floating in the uh, in ships around anywhere, and uh, six months at a time. And if there's a trouble, they they go do it first where the army has to build up all this stuff and because they uh, 
we were guerrilla fighters and they were, uh, uh, what do you call it? Anyway, armies, big armies and yeah. stuff like that. Okay, it makes me wonder why Ludwig motivated was in the script. He was trying to make a particular statement. When I went in the Marine Corps in 65, the, the theme was to rape, pillage, and plunder. And then uh, about 1969, they're all listening to psychedelic music. So, the badge. And uh, I, uh, I had a, a ammo box stuck to this uh, uh, screen, and then I had all my stuff in there. And every morning I'd go put a flower in that uh, little vase. I got her. I got. Not, I never got in trouble, but I got chewed out many times. You know, what are you, a flower child and stuff like that? I said, no, I just like beauty. Flower symbol of peace. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but, symbol of peace. But even though you're in a war and you're fighting, you want to be able not to be called chicken. You don't want to disgrace yourself. But the peace sign started coming because uh, in 68, there's was a lot of peace accords going on, which always fell through. And uh, so everybody's wanting to go home. And so that's another thing, like the song, uh, Kansas City, or uh, I Want to Go Home, these type of songs we would sing. And, and, but you, you make uh, comrades I have friends that was in my hooch, is what we call them, for the whole time that I was there. And I still know their names. I know where they live. I know what they do. Uh, they are my friends because I slept, ate, walked out. I, I was with them 24 hours a day, every day. So you, you, you another camaraderie thing, unless you're a goofball and they'll make. We don't like that. What happens to the goofballs? There wasn't many. We had one guy that had, he had, uh, he, his hips kind of swaying. <laughs> so we thought maybe he was queer. <laughs> but uh, he finally got engaged to one of the Vietnamese girls and wanted to send him home. Of course, they can't do that. And he's not supposed to be out of the compound anyway. So, and one aspect of the film, which call weak, call a weakness, is that it seems disconnected. For example, does boot camp select have to do with the Vietnam selection and the U.S.? They we take tests, and if you're a two-year guy, you're an infantry. If you're a four-year guy, you'll go to school. But they will test you, and uh, if you don't test very well, you'll become a grunt. So, so they, yeah, they kind of do it like that, so they know what's going on. But I don't know that there's a big conspiracy about it. It's just yeah. paperwork comes in, and it says, we need 10 of these, we need 20 of these. Well, this guy, he's should be over here, you know, so it's not, it's not known way early. May I ask what you were? Huh? May I ask what you were? Me? Mm -hmm. I was the combat engineer. Yeah, yeah, because you're an electrician. You give, build bridges, bridges. One time, uh -huh. it, the monsoon had been raining, and obviously, ducks let, live in wet weather. But this uh, wing wiper, uh, someone who flew the planes, he got me up 
and says, I think the, the ducks are cold. You, could you put a light bulb in there? So I had to crawl on this little two by two thing through the duck muck to put a light bulb in so the ducks don't get cold. I, I, there's so many things that I could say that uh, it would bore you, but there's things that go on that. Mm -hmm. But then also, a joker. Can you remind me of what a duck is? Huh? Of what a duck is? Quack, quack. Oh, you're talking about the bird. Yeah. So what do ducks have to do with the Vietnam War? We, we would give them to the people in the villages. Oh. That would be symbolic or something? Just, just to get friends because the uh, Viet Cong and or the North Vietnamese regulars would come through at night and do things and the people were afraid of them and they would hide ammunition and stuff. So we tried to do things to make them friendly and we paid them to, we had some that would cut your hair and uh, then it all changed after the Vietnam Tet Offensive, but, uh, and they just paid them a small amount. They didn't want them to make any more than they'd make in the economy so that, you know, there's not stuff going on. Yeah. I, I remember they had that, some girls that worked in the kitchen. I know all of them have long hair, obviously, black hair. And I watched her, you know, you got them 55 uh, gallon drums where you take your, your uh, uh, whatever it is, plate thing and put all the gook in there and then you push it here and that there and then you get it clean and put it back on. Anyway, she reached in there and uh, got a piece of meat. And you can imagine how gooey that is with everybody's tray stuck in there. And she put it up in her hair and she uh, tried to get away of doing it, but she got caught because the guys checked them before they leave. But I, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize enough how it, how important it is to boot camp, to be rude, to be mean to you. If you don't pass the rifle thing, you, there are all kinds of things that go on. But uh, we had one guy in, in one of the coaches, and we have a, our bayonets, and he. Uh, stuck it into his stomach. And he was happy to be in my hooch and so we went and got the DI and that. So while the ambulance was coming, he come in front of us all of us and he says, Now, let me show you how you do it right. All now I have to do is all this paperwork. If you would have killed yourself it would have just been dead. You know, pretty cruel. I don't know what happened to that guy, but uh, uh, as you know, there was uh, people getting drafted, and this was way before the number system. And, uh, Marines didn't normally draft, but there was a lot getting killed, and so they started drafting them a little bit. So, oh, and here you say, if many people and soldiers are unsure about what they're fighting for, what instance, what constitutes a military victory? First of all, they're not soldiers; they're Marines. Okay. They don't. They don't. They don't. Uh, that's a big deal. <laughs> I'll make a note of that. Because you went through all this stuff to get through it, and. Uh, It doesn't matter 
if you like the war or not. That has nothing to do with it. You are a Marine. You swore to follow commands. And, you know, like they swear in the president. You do what you're told. Yeah. And the other, some people might write home and be sad. And, but, and sometimes I was sad, but I realized that uh, mostly when I tell people about things that happened, mm -hmm. they think, oh, that you're exaggerating. You know, if I'm telling the truth, they say, you know, you're exaggerating. That never happened. They don't do that. But they do do that. So most of the time I don't tell people because they yeah. don't believe it anyway. Well, did you have? Did you, did you know what you're fighting for? Or yeah, President Kennedy. Can you put that on? Thing. I'll, I'll get the plaque. Do you want to press pause? Huh? Do you want to press pause? Yeah, just pause for a second. <laughs> This has no pause, it only has a stop. And this. I'm checking the toolbar looking for a pause button. Okay, why did I go? Yeah. President Kennedy said this in an inaugural address. Mm -hmm. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to ensure survival and success of the liberty. Mm. That's pretty powerful in my mind. Mm. And uh, a lot of guys, they hated, hated them. I don't know, I, I never did hate them. Uh, well, they hated them because you didn't know which one. They were a Viet Cong or they weren't. And during the day, they dressed like you and I would or whatever. At night, they put the black pajamas on and do some carnage. Mm -hmm. So, but the purpose was the North was invading the South. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of people who wanted to be free, who didn't want to be communists. And uh, unfortunately, they had a couple presidents of the country that were uh, bad and stole money and didn't do a good job and didn't unify. So I, I, I did believe in that. I honestly believe we were helping. Yeah. And the people I talked to said I was helping. Mm -hmm. So that makes me feel good that I'm not doing this for nothing. Yes. But in boot camp, the training to follow orders blindly. Blindly. But do they give you any purpose while you're doing your orders? Or? Nope. No. Nope. Other than if he had to uh, do push-ups, 
everybody has to do push-ups. Okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> nope, because they're a team. Yeah. So uh, we would have talks, a little bit of talks on some Sunday nights, and uh, to rouse us up a little bit, you know, about what was going on. Yeah. And so it says here, one aspect found that money would call weakness is that it seems disconnected. For example, what does the boot camp selection have to do with the Vietnam selection? We covered that. Yeah. And then it says, uh, Where was it about the sniper? Anyway, but I think the disorder actually was just to build them, build them up. If many people and soldiers, again, are unsure about what they're fighting for and start thinking about that, they won't follow orders. Uh -huh. And so you can't be thinking about that. If you're out on an ambush at night, you can't be thinking about what home is. Yeah. You gotta keep alert. So the other guy sometimes you'd have fifty fifty sleep. One would sleep for a couple hours and the other one in the foxhole. So you got some sleep, but mm -hmm. generally not. I actually find the boot camp session more disturbing than war itself. The soldiers and especially the uh, the obese struggled soldier have zero freedom, and yet, and they're yelled at. And what they yell, at, uh -huh. they get right in their face. Uh, I don't. I, I'll say something, then I'll try to say it so they get rude. They'll say something. Uh, Do you like me? Are you queer for me? And they says, "What do I look like?" Or, and then you would say something like, you, you know, did you know this? And they'd say, do I look like a four-legged F? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just anyway to, to gouge him. What are they trying to do when they, what's their, what's their motive when they yell at you and try to, or what, what are they trying to provoke? I think they're just basically provoking follow orders. Oh. Make sure that you uh, can do the obstacle courses, you know, that kind yeah. of plays on them. So, okay. but uh, okay, I, I find the boot camp disturbing the war itself. The soldiers, and especially the see one, have zero freedom and are yelled at. Everyone is yelled at. Uh -huh. But if they're fat like that, it's the DI's job to get him trim to make the able to do the obstacle course. Uh -huh. Like I said, if he didn't do it, he gets sent back. Yeah. And, uh, and it's changed. I was right when the old core was. Now the new core, uh, they don't treat him quite as rough. Oh. Uh, because they're all paid volunteer now. I mean, they're all paid. I started off at $60 a month, and with that $60, I had to pay $2 for starching my pants, had two sets. Mm -hmm. I had to pay for everything. My uh, toiletries, that doesn't give you a whole lot of money to, for extra. So Jill Strong uh, pushes the whole group. However, instead of revolting against the drill stars and for the obvious injustice, the troop take their rage out on the soldier by whipping him. Like I say, I don't think uh, there's not very many road cold, cold reds that actually happen, but sure they would because mm -hmm. one time I was doing uh, uh, I don't know. Anyway, putting my 
rifle above my arms and down and down like that. So I, I bit the sling. And so when I got here, I took a teeny rest and he caught me. So he says, Private Judd, come up here. And uh, he says, Private Judd's tired. He says, you all start doing push-ups until he feels like he wants to do them. And so, you know, they're, I'll kill you. My, my best friend was going to kill me. You know, <laughs> they, they, they hated me, not because the DI did it, because I screwed up. Mm-hmm. And it affected them. For example, oh, well, now you're expected to do a 50-mile hike mm-hmm. out of boot camp. The fat guy can't do it. Yeah. And so they, somebody helps him or stuff like that or take care of him. So there's a lot of physical training going on. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. if that guy is holding you down, they're, it's holding everybody down. They want to be the number one uh, company. They, they get a guide on, they get a dress balloons. Anyway. Oh, so this is kind of what builds teamwork and camaraderie. Huh? So this is kind of what builds teamwork and camaraderie. Yeah. Is it, it all fall or rise together? Right. It's okay. kind of a, a, a old way thinking, yeah. but it works. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, I actually found a little camp more than For example, one from the Yeah, see, that Jill, he's on that thing. So he's, yeah. he's cheating, and we're all trying to help him. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so what happens when that was done, when I was there, he'd pick up everybody's box and tuck them upside down. Then he'd say, I give you one minute to make your bed up and tie it up. And then he'd say, okay, I want you to take your fart sack off without messing up your bed. So you <laughs> sit there for a couple of seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna get this done. Then you realize you gotta do it, but it's just all part of that thing. The stage of purpose in camps is to create killers. That's right. They're going to war. This is not a game. And uh, uh, one slip up and somebody else gets killed. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. I also value the moral kind of sure of the film Joker. Well, that part of it was kind of a, just to make a story, but where the peace thing and stuff. But see that, like I said, that wasn't probably his helmet to begin with. May I ask how you felt about killing people? I felt that's why I joined. Okay. So you felt okay with it? I felt okay with it. Did he kill anyone? Well, I would say when you're in a firefight, you're all shooting. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Okay. But I remember one night we had a rocket attack. And uh, I, I looked up and the rocket was coming. It was a 181 millimeter rocket. And it was coming towards me. I'm running and running to get out to my post. And then it slammed into a carnage box that's, and didn't explode. Just, and then I looked up and there's another one. And so I'm running as fast as I can, and it's following me. And uh, it blew up about 10 feet from me, but it showed the mud up first. And so the strap metal didn't even touch me. Because they have fuses on them, how deep they want, want it to go. I did you tolerate well you know that because you've already said you'll do it and that's the end of it you yeah. can't get out you can't get out you can't get out 
I guess you could get a dishonorable discharge, and that would be with you forever. You can't yeah. vote. You can't vote with a dishonorable discharge? No. And uh, people would say, that was you in the military, what, you know, or something, and you'd say, I was dishonorable and you'd be discharged. That's really... Uh, so that's how the guy commits suicide. That's how what he was doing, because he couldn't get out. That was his only out. And sometimes... What if you just say it's too tough for me and too fat? No. It was a mistake patrolling? Just get down and start doing squats. I tell you, try <laughs> to get up there. Uh, you know, yeah. you know, when you go in, you you go into the drill instructor's uh, squad bay, and you have to look straight, not at him. Don't look down, straight. Private Doug requests permission to speak to the girl something. He may say yes and he may say no. But the other things, uh, like one guy had uh, pimples, really bad, blackheads. And uh, they were big. And uh, the DI goes over and he says, uh, don't you ever clean your face? And he says, well, my doctor told me not to pooch him off. He said, well, give me the sheet where the doctor says that. Well, you don't have a sheet because that was back in, you know, at your home. So <laughs> he exposed his blackhead out and it was about that long. He made him carry that all day and he made the other people walking by see that there's a black kid and black kid. Okay. Born to kill. Yeah, I, 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 there is a dichotomy there, but it's just you want peace, but you know why you joined the Marines and not one of the other services. And uh, that's what you were going to do. You know, I, a lot of Marines are tough guys out in the civilian thing. Too. Well, my soldiers, how that is. Bill was hasten to the enemy. For example, during the sniper scene, the men heroically and against orders, happily common sense, run into the scope, and I think he didn't shoot, right? The sniper shot. Huh? The sniper shot. He did you? Yeah, it was at the end scene. Yeah. Uh, but it's a lot harder to shoot somebody that's standing still than it is when you're rushing. It's harder? Yeah. When you stand like that, you're going to do, he doesn't see you. There's some of them guys yeah. can shoot a thousand yards. They're dead before you hear the crack of the rifle. Yeah, all the, uh, everybody wants their picture taken so they can get pictures from mom and dad. And oh. I was at that bridge in way. And uh, uh, one of the things that we didn't like about it is headquarters says don't shoot or blow up any of these temples. Well, the Kong were in the temples, and we couldn't shoot them down. Then finally, after a few days, they let us do it. But they were trying to be. And then... How did the South Vietnamese react to you blowing up the temples? I think some of them are very religious people. Because uh, there's also a thing called a stupa. Yeah. And they're... Ancestors are, are in there, the bones and 
got burned uh -huh. in there. So you just destroyed their ancestors. Couldn't get, into he get to heaven. Well, the point of this section is they would often demonize the enemy. You have to. If you if you make them human, then you start to think about. I, I don't. I don't want killing. Did you did you demonize the enemy? Or? Huh? Did you would you demonize the enemy too? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, and some of them ended up hating some of these guys, and I went to, on a mission to go help the people. Because when we left uh, Vietnam, three million uh, Vietnamese got killed by the communists. Yeah. But, you know, they were slaughtered. Let's take the picture of a dead cog and a helicopter machine gun. Yeah, uh, that guy. There are people that do that because they hit them all. Yeah. Uh, and so they shoot. That's pretty hard to hit when you're going a hundred miles an hour. <laughs> Most of it's back to them, sure. Yeah, it uh, that represents me a little bit. This is my boot camp uh -huh. picture. Do they all look exactly the same? Yeah. It's, it's, hard, hard, to it's hard to find out who's who you are, and that's what purpose is. You're not anybody, you're just a tool to do what you're doing. And and the rifle is a big thing. You, you pray to your rifle every night. Pray to it. Yeah, I forgot what the word is. This is my rifle, this is my gun, this is a penis. And, oh, and, uh, oh that, I, that was in the Full Man Jacket movie. Probably. And here's when I went to infantry training. You could maybe find me if I give you a clue. But that's a platoon, and this is a company. Mm -hmm. Put this in so that. And there was a hill there to pass boot camp. Mm -hmm. You have to run three miles with all your pack and your rifle and your boots and everything on. And you only got 32 minutes to get that done or you fail. And then, then you have to jump over a, I don't know if it's an eight or 10 foot ditch. That's all you should on. Then you have to climb up a rope and ring a bell. Uh, you have to do push-ups. I have got to get a couple hundred set-ups. I just barely, barely made the pull-up, so I, 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 I think somebody cussed me out. This is, uh, this will give you a, an idea, I'm trying to prove it. Tell you something. May I ask how many people died in your boot camp? Huh? How many people died in the boot camp? Oh, just that one. No. But oh, but I have a book that shows how many died when they got in Vietnam, uh -huh. and it was half or more. That's a lot. That's a lot. This is me in North Carolina, and he says, "Let me take your picture," and I says. You're going to help film in that. And he said, yes, I do. And I say, yeah, well, here, here, here's this. Take this. And, you know, <laughs> nobody's, if, uh, there's a truck. This is a picture of a, 
playmate, and we put it in front of us about 15 feet, and then tried to take the picture like we were holding it. <laughs> uh, this is a hooch. This is where we lived in Vietnam. It's in these hooches. Uh -huh. And a lot of drinking goes on. There was a lot of guys to come. This is me playing with the children down in Red Beach. Uh -huh. So I was a nice guy. Even though they were stealing me blind, taking stuff off the truck and burying the sand, you can't find it. But I, I did have a few drinks. There's me playing with the kids again. This was it. This guy played, he uh, was good at poker. He mm -hmm. bought a, a 67 Corvette when he went home. Cash. All from poker. <laughs> All from poker. And there's me. This is at lunchtime, and I'm already south. Yeah. This is Hog Conley. I don't know his name. That's Hog. During Tet, all they were shipping in was uh, food and ammunition. So I had some soap that my uncle had given me. Mm -hmm. And I said, you want me to cut it in half? And he said, no, I'll wait till it comes in. The funny thing is, though, we all like him. He's from Massachusetts. And there was some monsoon. Uh, they were going on patrol or something like that. We had to redo our sandbags all the time because they would rot. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know how long, it was, probably six weeks or something like that, I had to redo them. This is the lieutenant. And uh, on the Marine Corps birthday, he got his sword walked down in front of all the officers and cut the cake. <laughs> he got in big time trouble. <laughs> May I ask what's the point of a sword? Huh? What's the point of a sword? The sword is uh, Triple E is where we got the sword. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the Muslims were uh, keeping Americans, I think it was like 18, 10 or 20, mm -hmm. where that went. And on the stripes in Chapultepec uh -huh. was a bloody fight, and it was all NCOs that had it. So from a sergeant, from a corporal up, they have a red band, which is different. That means to remember the blood that was spilled. These, these are some friends that or from my hometown, they found me. And uh, there's uh, hooches again. This is a rocket attack. That's my hooch right there. Uh -huh. Of course, I'm out in that bunker right over there. So. <laughs> Did you see any combat? I, well, I know you saw combat. I didn't place. see. I wasn't an uh, infantryman. Mm -hmm. So you, I, you didn't actually fight in the major battles? I did during Tet. Tet Offensive. Tet Offensive, they attacked every single large city in the country on the same time, same day. This is where it's across the street. This is where we had to pee in that pipe that you get down in there. <laughs> and then since I had the truck, mm -hmm. I'd have to be the pitcher pumper. So they'd get a guy that has a little motor that come there and suck the pee out, which is green. And then I'd take him out to Red Beach and dump it into the ocean. Is that illegal now? Not in war. Is it polluting? Huh? Is it polluting? Pollu I don't know. It's supposed to be purified, isn't it? <laughs> Pee? Oh, <yeah. laughs> we caught these guys on the island. I was with these. Uh -huh. And we napalmed them. 
and then the government passed these things out from the airplanes, and I don't know what it says, but it's basically saying Chinese are eating it and you're eating the crumbs. Uh, this is, uh, these were all Viet Cong who traded, they called too high, joy. And they come on our side and we give them some money and a job that they wouldn't fight anymore. Yeah. Is he a prisoner of war? Huh? Is he a prisoner of war? Yeah. But we let him have a cigarette. But you don't want him to know where you're at. Oh, I see. These are just friends, and this is just villages right close by. It's a puffer fish. Really? But one of that full of them, they, mm -hmm. I don't know, and so did something to make him stay full. Do they eat it? Um, I think they did. They, they didn't have, they, the country couldn't feed itself. That was the other thing that was happening. Mm -hmm. So without some help. But I found this guy. Uh, here. He was in that. Uh, these are. Uh, rice paddies. And so, unless you're up in the mountains, they gotta, they grow them and they fight in them, but you gotta keep your head low. A lot of temples. And we dug up all of these because they, the Kong or the NBA, would bury ammunition or rice underneath them. What are they? Graves. So I had to dig up all the graves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this picture here, the uh, poop and stuff in the rice field. That's how they get manure out there. Uh -huh. They don't have bathrooms. Mm -hmm. So they recycle. <laughs> that's smart. Oh, here's one that's been planted already. See? And then they fill this full of water. And when the, gra the rice gets full, they take the water out of the Mekong. Mm -hmm. And when the rice is ready, there's all these little fish in there. Mm -hmm. So they get rice and they get fish. Mm -hmm. So are they working it down or are they just dump right. in one section and work in another section? They try to uh, make it so this is, as soon as this sec section is done, then this one's ready. So that they oh, can. Oh, when I said done, I meant poo. Oh. They were they working the poo or were they pile the poo in one section and then work in another no, section? No, they just go out. And work in it? Yeah, well, they just, that, just, they just go out there and poo. They don't, <laughs> have, a, they don't have a bathroom. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is Japan, so it's not. Okay. Did that give you an understanding? Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. That's easy to answer a question instead okay. of me trying to figure out what you want. How, how were you treated after the war? When I went in in 65, mm -hmm. America was excited about going to war. When I came back, 
flower children had developed treated badly. I got in a fight at San Francisco Airport, and uh, I didn't wear my uniform most of the time because I didn't want to, because they see my ribbons and they'd kill me. Oh, you get that in for killing babies? So they come up to you in a costume? Yeah. I, I got to them to know the story. My mm -hmm. stepbrother was in Chu Lai, which is down a ways in the middle. And I got a little R and R to go see him. It was three day I could still go see him. So I uh, got down there and he wasn't in July. He had moved out to an artillery base where he was at. And uh, they were doing a search and destroy mission going this way and I'm walking this way. So they, the the colonel thought I was a deserter. But I had all the papers and stuff. So he, he got a helicopter and took me up to their camp. The Army guys, they had picked them all up out of Texas and never even taught them how to eat sea rations. You, you use a John Wayne book, you call it, but it's a little cook. And then so the smoke would come out and you tip it upside down and put the other one there. Well, they kept trying to get them to light, but they wouldn't light because they didn't make the... So they were all, when I'd seen them, they'd been there for, I don't know, maybe several months and mm -hmm. never had a hot meal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then they take me over to my brother and we got some small arms fire at us and all of a sudden all these guys are next to me i said don't get don't get don't get by me you know let them shoot at you over there not shoot at me mm -hmm. i realized that night that i had an m14 and i had it was a uh, 7.24 uh, caliber bullet and the M16 is a 22 caliber bullet so I didn't have any I had 20 bullets in this <laughs> that's all I had I didn't have any more glad it stopped so the next day uh, they they had some Vietnamese washing the dishes and stuff for them I walked down to get something to eat, and every one of them left. And they wouldn't come back until I left. They could tell the, our uniforms were different than this one. It's a baby killer type situation. Again, but uh, I don't know if that was quite interesting. Yeah. So, any other questions? Did I answer all these? I have one more, and then we'll, and then I'll go. Okay, and then I want you to think about some more of them. I will. I know how to do this again sometime. Because uh, I don't know. I have a lot of stories that uh, are kind of funny, but are serious that I've never told anybody. You know, so anyway, what's the next one? Well, you can just tell them. I can be my computer next time. You can just tell the story you want. No questions asked. Just whatever comes to you. Okay. Well, I'm but trying my, to keep some of them clean. <laughs> well, my last question is, how were you treated after the war in Utah? Not surrounding Not nation, but in Utah. Badly. So even in Utah, that anti-war movement was pretty strong. Yeah, and mainly because the college students didn't want to get drafted. Oh. And they're the ones that were protesting. It yeah. wasn't the other people. It's just they didn't want to go to war. Uh -huh. And so that... And then, like, uh, Kennedy, mm -hmm. who just did the Iran deal, 
from Massachusetts. Yeah. Born, but he turned all his ribbons and threw them in the in the wedding pool in D.C. and got up and was against the war and, and uh, trying to get the war to stop. Johnson couldn't understand why uh, 200,000 Americans couldn't win the war. But actually, the war was won after that. There were no more Viet Cong. And then, I think it's Walter Conquex said on TV, the war is lost. And then all that was left was North Vietnamese regulars. And so they're easier to fight because they're an army. Yeah. And so we actually won. And then they had a treaty that we signed to end the war. And people keep saying we lost the war, but we signed a treaty mm-hmm. and we left. And uh, then they broke the treaty and went down. And in the Saigon and did all that stuff. It's interesting, like the, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a picture of a little girl, she had burn marks all over her uh, body and she's running away. And that changed everybody thinking about the war. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is, that was done by the Viet Cong, not us. Yeah. But no one told them. That just it was us that did it. And there, and, uh, and then the, there was a spy, and uh, was on TV, and he shot the spy on TV and blew his head off. And that, oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, that uh, wasn't very good taste. No. <laughs> I. I I, I don't know. I would. I think I'd go back again. You go back again. I believe what we were doing was right. It's just politics get in the way. You know that little kid that uh, right now they're showing that drowned, going to Turkey because they're all uh, refugees. And you know who? Have you ever seen that picture? I don't watch the news. Oh, and they, they got a picture of this little kid, and they're trying to make everybody feel bad that we're not helping the Muslims uh-huh. more. Well, why do we want to help the Muslims who want to kill us? That, 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 that dumbfounds me anyway. But really what the story is, is the dad was making 17 bucks an hour, and he had a sister in Canada and she was giving me money but so he he went to I think it was Turkey to get a job he wasn't a refugee and he was going to go back but they don't tell that once you got a picture in somebody's mind the press Some people, I don't know what you think, but the press is, they don't do stories anymore, they do sensations. And, uh, and they lie. <laughs> and they lie. And they probably both sides lie some, but, you know, but, uh, uh-huh. they're definitely not on our side. <laughs> I don't think the press ever helps worse. <laughs> no. But it's that was too terrible to watch that on TV, because the parents look and see if that's a kid in there. Who, <laughs> who was that that dead and they're dragging? Uh-huh. You hate to look and see your son get yeah get his head shot off. Absolutely. <laughs>